this seems like long enough. Oh, all right. Um, well, thank you everyone for coming and being here for this lovely December presentation, unfortunately not in person, um, but I'd really love to introduce our speaker for the PATH Presents today. This is Dr. Bruno. Um, he is a really phenomenal uh, researcher and we're really excited to get to hear from his work. Uh, he is the director of the Gladstone Institute of Cardiovascular Disease and a senior investigator at the Gladstone Institutes, a professor of pediatrics at UCSF. He is our neighbor from the north and earned his bachelor's and doctorate from the University of Ottawa, completed his postdoctoral fellowship at Harvard, um, and prior to arriving at the Gladstone was a professor in Toronto. Uh, Dr. Bruno has established himself and his lab as internationally acclaimed experts in epigenetics and gene regulation in cardiac biology and disease. He holds the William H. Younger Chair in Cardiovascular Research, is an AHA Fellow, and earned the AHA Esophilist Investigator Award. I'm sure this is going to be an excellent talk, and we're really excited to hear what you have to say. Thanks. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for that, that very kind uh, introduction that I now have to live up to. <laughs> um, so I'm going to turn on my slides. You guys let me know. OK, you're going to see my full slides at the moment? Yep. OK. And, and did that advance? Yep, good to go. Okay. OK, great, perfect. I don't know, you never know from one presentation to the next uh, what, what might happen. So thank you so much for, for having me on. It's a, it's, a, it's a real pleasure. And it really is a shame that I can't be there in person. Um, but hopefully uh, the, the, the science will be entertaining enough. Um, so I'll dive right in. Uh, my lab's inter in, interested in general in, in what controls lineage specification. So how do you get from, you go from pluripotent stem cells to uh, lineage committed cells to then differentiation into what we're most interested in, which is cardiac myocytes. And how is, is this different from cells that take a different path towards making neurons with the same genome uh, as an instruction set, as a template. And in understanding this, we'd like to understand what, um, what creates the shift from developmental plasticity to phenotypic stability. And of course, how is this phenotypic stability reversed or impaired, for example, in the case of heart failure or in you know, the most extreme cases, cancer? And so the biology that we've been uh, tackling for now for almost 20 years in the lab um, is gene regulation. And, and basically pretty much anything that touches DNA or chromatin we're interested in understanding the function of in the context of cardiac uh, gene regulation. That includes DNA binding transcription factors, chromatin or modeling complexes. And those are the two things that I'm gonna tell you about today. We've also done work on histone modifications and more recently, on 3D interactions uh, of, of the genome. So like I said, the first vignette I'm gonna tell you about is work on DNA binding transcription factors. Excuse me. And so this centers around a transcription factor that we've been working on for a long time now, since my postdoc years. Um, it, it's uh, called TBX5. It's a member of the T-box family of transcription factors, the originating member of which is Bracuri or T. Um, and in 1997, in John and Cricket Seidman's lab, they discovered that patients with a rare syndrome called Holt Orm syndrome that comprises limb and congenital heart defects had heterozygous mutations in TBX5. So here's an echocardiogram of a patient who has a TBX5 mutation. And you can see here the double-headed uh, double arrow is showing a communication between the left and the right ventricles, which shouldn't be there. Um, and these, this is what's called a muscular ventricular septation defect. And, and this is fairly common uh, in, in the congenital heart disease population. And in work that I did as a postdoc in the last millennium, I showed that TBX5 has a, a dynamic and interesting expression pattern where it's expressed uh, in both atria and the developing heart and in the left ventricle, but is absent from the right ventricle and the outflow tract. And so these findings of TBX5 uh, human mutations in congenital heart disease uh, illuminated two important things. One, it, it, it placed a spotlight on developmentally important transcription factors as causative for congenital heart disease. And that's, this has been borne out over and over again um, from human genetics, uh, human genetic studies. The other uh, aspect of, of, of transcription factor biology that we still don't understand, but is really important, is that it predicts that TBX5 
haploinsufficiency. So only a 50% dosage reduction in, in TBX5 is sufficient to create problems in a gene regulatory network that might then be reflected in congenital heart defects, implying that the stoichiometry of transcriptional regulators is really, really important. Okay, so over the last, like I said, uh, almost 20 years, we've been studying uh, this in the mouse, and I'm going to give you one uh, tiny mouse vignette on, on where we're going to, to, I think, finally understand this to some degree, is we made the fortuitous discovery a number of years ago that if we traced the combination of a TBX5 lineage and the lineage of Brian Black's anterior heart field enhancer of MEF2C, we could get a, a lineage label pulsing very early on during gastrulation, a lineage la label that lit up the cells that abut the left and the right ventricles just where the interventricular septum is forming. And these cells persist, and it's pretty almost the only location in the heart that these cells contribute to. So we have a beacon that we can, we can look at to understand the cells that are forming the interventricular septum. And so what, what I'm showing you here uh, is, um, excuse me, is, is a 3D light sheet microscopy where we've labeled the hearts in green with a TBX5 lineage and in red with this intersectional lineage. And you can see here in the back of this wild type heart, this really nice lining up um, of these red cells right at the border of the RV and the LV. And down at the bottom, I'm showing you mice where we've inactivated the other copy of TBX5 using the TBX5 Cre. And what you can see is that, first of all, the morphology of the ventricles is a bit different. And now the, the lineages don't line up as neatly um, as they should. If we look at the, through a, a virtual slice, again, at two different planes of section, you can see these cells lining up very nicely uh, or, and accumulating here at where the AV node is going to be. But again, a very sharp boundary, like a Roman phalanx that's keeping cells from mixing with, with one another. And in, in the mutants, what you see is that you have these, these large gaps um, where there are no red cells or red cells that are going in, in the wrong place and sometimes wandering out as far as in the right ventricle as shown in G. And here, if you look really close up here, you can see that first of all, there's, there's a ventricular septation defect in H. So we definitely have a defect here. And then the cells that, that are at, at, the, at the base of the interventricular septum are largely absent uh, from, from the mutants. And again, you can see this disorganization, this intermixing of cells that normally is kept at bay by what is akin to a compartment boundary. And so now we're deploying single cell modality, single cell RNA-seq and ATAC-seq to try to understand um, you know, what's going on. And we hope to get at the actual cell biology of interventricular septum formation and how it goes wrong in congenital heart disease. Okay, but that's in mouse. And you know, we'd like to understand human development and human congenital heart disease. And, and as you know, from Chuck Murray's lab and, and, and others, you know, you can take human ES cells or IPS cells and mimic development um, and you get these sheets of, of beating cardiac myocytes. Um, but I would challenge the, 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 the most distinguished cardiac anatomist to tell me where the interventricular septum is in this 2D uh, plate uh, of cells. Is, is there even, are there even atrial and ventricular cells? What are they? And can we model human congenital heart disease? And so there's two possible scenarios for how TBX5 haploinsufficiency might cause congenital heart defects. One is that it affects gene re regulatory network in specific subsets of cells that, that are more vulnerable to reduce TBX5 dosage. And those are the cells, for example, in the interventricular septum or in, in the AV node. Or, and it's, these are not mutually exclusive scenarios, that, that reduced dosage of TBX5 affects broad gene regulatory networks in all cardiac myocytes, but that certain anatomical structures are more sensitive to those disruptions. And I'll give you the punchline, which is that it's both. Okay, so the work I'm gonna share with you um, is the work of, of Irfan Kateria, who's a pediatric, pediatric cardiac anesthesiologist and, and with, a, with a, a fairly extensive team of, of folks over the years who have contributed uh, to this work, but notably uh, Kavita Rao was our lab manager. And so what Irfan and his team did is that they took uh, Bruce Conklin's uh, very well characterized and, and robust wild type C11 IPS cell line, and then used CRISPR editing uh, to create a sublines that were either control, so have, have seen the CRISPR machinery, have been passaged, um, but don't have an indel, then uh, might, uh, mice, uh, IPS cell lines that are heterozygous for 
uh, a deletion of TBX5 that creates a frame shift mutation and two independent lines um, that are completely null for TBX5. So complete TBX5 loss function, which we never see uh, in humans. There's no humans uh, with, that are homozygous for TBX5 mutations. And what you can see is that there's a, so there's two main isoforms of TBX5 and they have uh, reduced uh, abundance in the TBX5 hets, which is the disease model. And there's complete absence of TBX5 protein in the homozygote. So we have an allelic series from 100% to 50% to 0% TBX5. And so then what, what uh, Irfan did is take these, these, uh, this allelic series, differentiate them. These days we use the stem cells inc uh, stem diff protocol and capture them at day six, which is cardiac precursors. And then days uh, 11 and 23, which is early and later cardiac myocyte. So I mentioned that we can't see ventricular septation defect because there's no septum, but can we detect uh, physiological alterations that might match what we see in the whole arm syndrome. And indeed we find, and so the color codes here are black and green are the parental and control lines. Red is the heterozygous disease model and blue is the homozygous null. And so by patch clamp, what we find is that there's a, a slight but not statistically significant prolongation of the action potential uh, in the TBX5 hets. And this is consistent with, with slowed conduction um, in patients with, with TBX5 mutation. And in the homozygotes, there's, there's definitely prolongation, sometimes extreme prolongation of the action potential. When we look at calcium transients, we actually find a, a significant uh, alteration in, in the waveform. And in particular here, we've measured the T90 down uh, time and there's a, st a statistically significant increase in the T90 down and, and, and other uh, parameters. And this again is exacerbated in, in the homozygote. And when we look at sarcomere uh, integrity and size, what we find is that the, the TBX5 mutants have, it's hard to, to see, but they have a higher degree of sarcomere disarray compared to the wild types of the controls. And this is even worse in the homozygotes where you can see these little shards of sarcomeres and the cells are much larger in the homozygotes, but not in the heterozygotes. And the level of disarray is quantitated here where there's a greater proportion of heterozygous and homozygous cells that have a measurable disarray. So we have cellular phenotypes that correspond with some of the physiological features that we find uh, in humans with, uh, that are heterozygous for TBX5 mutations. So what can we learn about what TBX5 regulates? So we used uh, the Tenex genomics drop seek technique to do single cell RNA sequencing at these time points, day six, day 11, and day 23. So what I'm showing you here in this figure are UMAPs of the tens of thousands of cells that we captured by, by RNA-seq. And what you can see uh, is, is two main things. One is that the number of distinct clusters uh, increases. So the complexity of the, the cell diversity increases over time of differentiation. And also, the, 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 the genotype-based drivers of separation of cluster identity also increase over time. So what I mean is that, for example, at day six, the clusters are not defined by genotypes. All, all genotypes uh, blend, blend together. So there's no uh, identity or gene expression signature change that's significant enough uh, in, in the mutants at, at these time points. But by the time you get day to day 11, now, whereas the majority of the clusters are mixing the genotypes. Now you start to see this wild type cluster up here next to a heterozygous cluster next to a homozygous cluster. So now there are some of the cells are being distinguished, um, not necessarily just on their cell type, but based on the levels of TBX5 that they have within them. Then by day 23, this is a lot clearer where you have this large cluster here that's wild type and control. It's adjacent to a red heterozygous cluster, and then the homozygous clusters um, are out here. Okay, so what can we learn about this single cell data? First of all, the question was, what type of cells do we have and do they change in the mutants? Um, and you know, one can do patch clamp and look at action potential shape and say, ah, this looks more like an atrium and this looks more like a ventricle, but do we really know that they have that identity? So what we did is to develop a machine learning classifier that we trained on fetal human heart data from Michaela Asp's paper from last year that was published in Cell. And what we were able to ascertain with, with very high probability, which is shown down here, is that the majority of the wild type and, and het cells are ventricular-like, with some of them 
in, in dark purple being atrial-like, and that the homozygous cells um, are sort of a mix of, of ventricular-like and, and atrial-like. There's also some fibroblast cells, some epicardial cells, and some cells are in a little defined, and a few uh, endothelial cells, and so on. So when we look at the cardiac myocytes, and, and, and we, when we plot these, you show these, these cascade plots, what you can see is that the major in the wild type and control, the majority of the cells are 100% ventricular cells, whereas there's a small sliver of them, a small percentage um, that are atrial-like in character. And there's about 20% that have this mixed phenotype where the classifier can't assign them to either a ventricular or a, an atrial cell. And the proportion of these mixed cell types is, is slightly increased uh, in the heterozygotes, and it's more than doubled in, in the TBX5 homozygote. So it seems that as you reduce the dosage of TBX5, you blur the distinction between the cell's character of, of, ventric, of definitely ventricular versus definitely uh, atrial and, and they have more of a mixed phenotype. So, so what does this mean? What, 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 what is happening? So here we uh, deployed the trajectory inference uh, package URD that was developed in Aviv Regev and Alex Shear's lab. And, and we took as, as a root the OCT4 positive uh, mesoderm, uh, mesendoderm cells. And as the tips, uh, the final clusters that are, and we're going to focus on, on the, the, the cardiac myocytes. And here on the left are the, uh, wild, the parental and controls in, in black and green. And you can see as, as you follow my cursor, you follow this dashed line, they follow the stepwise differentiation to mesoderm, to cardiac precursors, and to then to cardiac myocytes, various types of cardiac myocytes, some cycling, uh, some not. And they populate these mainly these two branches of what we're calling, calling the trident. Now the heterozygous cells also follow robustly this little path. And once they get to the cardiac myocyte trident, they also populate this, this middle fork, but then go populate this other one. And these are the cells that have acquired a different uh, phenotype from, uh, from the controls. In contrast, the homozygous uh, cells make it to, to mesoderm, they start making cardiac precursors, but instead of, of veering left, they take a right turn and, and go and form part of this fork where they, where they populate these two branches right here. And so what's different between this trajectory and this trajectory? When we do a differential expression analysis on the fork versus the trident, we find three maiden categories. One is that there's a delay here in the activation of NKX25, an important partner uh, of TBX5 that's important for uh, expression of cardiac genes. And what you can see is that it only acquires expression later in the homozygotes, or sometimes not at all, it's sometimes completely absent, whereas it's present equally in the wild types and the heads. We lose ventricular markers, and we gain in the homozygotes markers of the AV canal, like our spondin 3. And to some degree, we have expression of this in the wild type and, and the heads in this particular branch. So we think that this mixed identity is actually reflective of, of what might one consider an AV canal type identity. Now, what does this mean in terms of, of the congenital heart defects? We're not clear. Um, but it definitely shows that TBX5 regulates the path of differentiation towards a clear ventricular versus atrial fate. Okay, so, let, so let's learn now what are the gene regulatory networks that TBX5 regulates. So TBX5 is mostly expressed in cardiac myocytes. So we computationally subsetted on troponin T positive cells and reclustered. This is what the clusters look like. So there's about 15 different clusters. And again, the controls uh, stick together. They're near, but not complete, not very much mixing with the HETs. And then the homozygous knockouts are, are out in their own um, UMAP space. So then the question is what, um, what clusters do you compare to understand what's different between a wild type and a knockout? Do you take 15 versus seven or you take two versus five? And so we computationally built a sort of a, a family tree that tells us which clusters are closer to one another. And, and what I've highlighted boxed here is that for example, um, cluster one, which is largely wild type can be compared to cluster two, which is largely het. So this cluster here and this cluster there. Similarly, cluster five and cluster seven are close to these ones, but they're distinct. Cluster five is about half and half wild type and het and cluster seven is mostly het. So what do we learn from making these cluster to cluster comparisons? Um, shouldn't all these cells just be all, all the same? Well, they're not. Um, and, and that's what's really interesting. So here I'm showing you bubble plots um, of top 10 uh, expressed uh, altered genes in a variety of categories, comparing this cluster five with this cluster seven. 
And what and the, the the size of the bubble is the number of cells that express the transcript, and the intensity of the color is is how uh, how, how much the the gene is expressed. And so what you can see, for example, is that in cluster seven, there's a marked decrease in all cells of titan, while there's a gain uh, of, of MYL2. And similarly, a, a, a loss of uh, uh, SLC8A1, which, uh, which encodes uh, the NCX, the sodium calcium uh, exchanger. What I've color coded in purple are genes that have, are genetically associated with human congenital heart disease. So you can see there's a lot of purple colored genes. Some people's favorite transcription factors like HAM2, some people's favorite histone modifiers like KDM5B but all of them involved in human congenital heart disease. So TBX5 seems to be at a nexus of, of genes that are genetically involved in congenital heart disease. And, it, and then orange are genes that are involved in electrophysiological function or excitation contraction coupling. So for example, uh, sodium calcium exchanger and ranadine receptor, which you can see is, is reduced, which correlates with the, the calcium defects. And so now if we look at this other comparison, cluster, cluster one uh, versus two, we see on the top here, the same set of genes that we see in cluster five versus seven comparison, maybe the number of cells expressing them and the change in, in expression uh, is different, but the same genes pop up and they change in the same direction. Wherever, whereas down here, there's, there's a different signature that's specific to this cluster comparison where there's a whole other set of genes um, like signaling molecules like BMP2 and Bambi that are, that are upregulated uh, some genes like a, a, ATP2B1 that are downregulated, um, and so on. And so, by looking at all these different clusters, we learn that that there are some genes that are commonly dysregulated in the heterozygous mutants versus the versus the wild types, but that there are discrete subpopulations that have a specific response in their gene regulatory networks to the reduced dosage of TBX5. Now, I haven't talked about the homozygotes, but here, when we bring in the wild type, the het, and the homozygote, now we can start thinking about genes that, that have varying sensitivity to reduced uh, TBX5 expression. So for example, NPPA is highly sensitive to TBX5 dosages, almost completely off in, in almost all the cells in the TBX5 heterozygotes, and, and it doesn't get much worse in the TBX5 homozygotes. Whereas down here, TechRL, which is involved in, 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 uh, the, in sodium channel function, um, it is partly reduced in, in a proportion of the cells uh, in the TBX5 hats, and it's mostly off um, in, the, uh, in the homozygotes. Same thing with GGA1 and the reverse for, for phospholamban. Again, pointing to uh, our, our electrophysiological parameters. You can see here by RNA scope, uh, NPPA, mRNA in, in the parental and controls, and it's almost undetectable and completely undetectable in the hats and the homozygotes. All right, so we have this list of genes that point towards cellular phenomenon that indicate the, 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 um, the differential uh, uh, sensitivity in various populations. Um, but you know, this doesn't tell us really where in the heart these genes might be acting. Again, it's genes in 2D in a dish. So we again turn to Michaela Asp's paper where they had done not only um, fetal heart single cell RNA-seq, but they had done spatial transcriptomics uh, with the, the earlier, the original version of what Tenex now markets as Visium. And so here's an H&E section of one of the human hearts that, that they looked at. And here's the, the, the categorization of the different cells where you have atria, you have outflow tract, you have uh, uh, trabecular myocardium, you have compact myocardium and AV canal. So it's coarse resolution, but at least it gives us some general anatomy. And so we painted on, we sort of downloaded their data and then painted on uh, our uh, expression of, of, of our genes or looked for expression of the genes that are dysregulated in the iPS cell and the TBX5 mutants. And the darker the orange, the higher the expression. And you can see that as with what we think of in the mouse, TBX5 is highest in the atria at this stage and it's expressed sort of broadly at low levels in the ventricles. And PPA is very high in the atria, high in the LV trabecular uh, cells, and then lower levels in the compact myocardium. IREX4 is ventricle specific. And then here's one that we didn't know about, call 2 a one which is upregulated in the TBX5 heterozygotes, and it seems to be atrial specific. And we didn't know that until, until we looked here. And so now we can, we can correlate all of the genes that have altered expression. Here, I'm only showing you the downregulated ones 
with a spatial transcriptomic annotation. And we could say, ah, we've got genes here like BMP4 and ID2 that are mostly restricted to the AV canal. So these might, in a patient with TBX5 mutations, be affecting AV canal formation. And similarly, these genes here would be affecting atrial uh, morphology or function and so on and so forth. So we can devise hypotheses on where um, these, these might act based on these spatial transcriptomics. Okay, so we'd like to understand broadly what the gene regulatory networks are. And to do so, we collaborated with, with uh, Holger Heinz lab at the CRG in Barcelona, where they had developed an algorithm called Big Scale 2 that instead of using absolute levels of genes or a priori knowledge of protein protein interactions, for example, builds gene regulatory networks simply based on taking small populations, su small subsets of cells within the thousands of cells in the single cell RNA-seq looking at all of the genes and how they correlate. So they look at the Z score of transcripts versus one another ac across cell types and then, and then iteratively uh, sam sampling some more to then build this network where each line is the link, the connection between, between a gene and, and another gene within the network. And the dot, the, the bubble, is, is the degree of centrality. And in this case, the degree of centrality we're, we're measuring is using PageRank, which is the algorithm that Sergey Brin and, and Larry Page used to found Google, which, is, which ascribes not just a connection, but gives a quantitative metric of the importance of that connection um, within, within the, the network. And that's why Google was a much better search engine than say AltaVista is because you could find things that are more relevant rather than just the stuff that, that is connected. And so this, this degree of centrality is, is quantitative within the network. And so I'm showing you here a wild type network up at the top and a TBX5 heterozygous network at day 11 at the bottom. And colored in purple are some genes that are involved in congenital heart disease and in red, some important cardiac tra tra transcriptional regulators. And the two things that I've circled are SMAD2, which is present uh, in the, the wild type network, but it's completely absent now from, from the TBX5 heterozygous network. So it's been kicked out um, of the network. The other one that was of interest is MEF2C, a transcription factor that works with TBX5 in cardiac reprogramming. And in vitro has been shown to coactivate genes with TBX5 and it has reduced uh, centrality, statistically significant reduction in centrality um, in, in, in many measures that, 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 that we looked at. And this is despite the fact that the MEF2C mRNA levels don't change. So, it's, so this is not because there's just lower levels of MEF2C. It's because the connections that MEF2C has have been disrupted uh, in, in many ways that it is no longer as central in the network as it used to be. And so now if we, if we to, to, to ascribe further importance to the, the genes that have reduction in page rank, we've plotted all of the genes that have a TBX5 reduction in page rank and looked at the correlation across the cells with TBX5. And again, MEF2C is right at the top. It, it not only has reduced centrality, but it's one of the most correlated in, a, in expression levels with TBX5 in the cells uh, that we've looked at, as well as other uh, genes that are involved in congenital heart disease. And here's ryanodine receptor that, that I showed you has reduced expression. So what can we learn? Uh, so we've got MEF2C that really is, is at the top and we've thrown other uh, analyses at it and, and MEF2C always comes up sort of in our, in our top 10. So this predicts that there might be a genetic interaction between MEF2C and TBX5. So we turned to the mouse to test this prediction and we used uh, the, our TBX5 create ERT2 knock-in line, which turns out to be a hypomorph. So if we make these mice homozygotes, um, they have structural defects in the heart, but as heterozygotes, unlike the TBX5 straight null het, um, their hearts are perfectly intact. And so we bred these hypomorph TBX5 mice to MEF2C heterozygous mice, which also have normal uh, heart formation. And in compound hets, now we see muscular ventricular septation defect, reproducible from mouse to mouse. Sometimes it's a, it's a membranous uh, VSD, but this uncovers an exquisitely sensitive genetic interaction between TBX5 and MEF2C in the formation of the interventricular septum. And so now we, 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 we'd like to tease apart what is the subnetwork that's regulated by the interaction of these two transcription factors and might that inform um, the e etiology of, 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 of uh, VSDs. Hey, Benoit. Yep. This is Chuck. Sorry to interrupt you. I just, I, I'm struck by the, the, the marked dilation of the right atrium in, mm -hmm. in, the, in the bottom two in your compound heads. 
And yeah. is 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 the tricuspid valve all right? Or what what do you think is is up with the marked atrial dilation? Yeah, I mean, I, I, we see that often uh, at this stage of where, where we have congenital, we have heart defects. You know, unlike unlike humans who who have certain types of defects, you mice really don't do well in utero with with any kind of, of defect that alters their hemodynamics. So I think it's partly a reflection um, of that. The other thing that we did not do is measure cardiac function, right? So so it may be that we're we can see on histology a structural defect, but it may be that that they have you know, systolic impairment, and we're seeing that because they just can't contract properly, and so they just have blood pooling in the uh, in the atrium. So it could be a combination of those two. Yeah, but but so far as you know, the the valve morphogenesis on the right side is okay. Yeah, no, it looks good. Uh, yeah, no, looking close up, it looks it looks okay. Okay, thank you. Yep, thanks. Okay, so the last bit in regard to this is 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 there a molecular correlate? So we collaborated with Bill Poo's lab who was generating an in vivo ChIP-seq uh, data set for various cardiac transcription factors. And I'm showing you here two loci um, where that, that are down dysregulated in, in TBX5 HET IPS cells. And you can see that there's, there's co-occupancy of TBX5 with MEF2C and with MEF2A, which also falls out of the, of, of the GRN. And, and the statistics on this is that this is more often uh, than by chance. And so we think that there's, that there's a, a, a functional uh, correlate there. So we've been able to, you know, from, from IPSL uh, modeling to single cell RNA-seq to with the computational approaches, excuse me, GRN networks to then be able to predict a new genetic interaction for congenital heart disease. And, and, and we hope that this, can, that this rich data set uh, can, can reveal uh, more, uh, more instances of this. And of course, we're now deploying um, other, other approaches to try and understand what's the molecular basis of the TBX5 haplode deficiency um, where does TBX5 go when there's only 50% uh, of it left and, and what happens to the Crompton landscape? And so that'll be the next chapter uh, in this story. All right, so I'm gonna move on to, to the second part, which is also uh, unpublished, um, which has to do with Crompton remodeling complexes. And so these are large macromolecular complexes that move nucleosomes around or evict nucleosomes, um, allowing things to go and bind uh, DNA or preventing uh, things from, from binding DNA. And this is the work of uh, Swetansu Hota, a postdoc in the lab, who will be going on the job market soon, if anybody's interested in his work, and also with, uh, with a great group of, of collaborators within and outside of the lab. And Swetansu joined the lab from, from a, 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 a chromatin biochemistry lab, wanting to understand the, the function of chromatin modeling complexes in mammalian development, specifically in heart development. And he focused on a, a complex that we've been working on for a number of years now called the BAF complex or the BRG1 or BRM associated factor complexes that are graphically illustrated here. They have uh, one of two mutually exclusive ATPases, the engines of, of, the, of the complex, which are either Brahma regulated gene one or Brahma. And then there's an, an assembly of many other subunits that are again are represented by, by one or or another isoform of the protein in mutually exclusive manner. So for example, BAF60, so a complex containing the, the 60 kilo Dalton uh, BAF uh, subunit protein can only have BAF60A or BAF60B or BAF60C. And this applies to many of the other subunits. So you can imagine there's a complexity in the multimeric assembly um, of these complexes. And we got interested in, in, in this in work that, that, that we did a number of years ago, where we found together with Jenna Rosten's lab that, that BAF60C encoded by SMRCD3 is largely uh, enriched in the developing heart and in the developing somites and is important for the formation of the heart. And that functionally it may be involved in, in allowing the binding of cardiac transcription factors such as GATA4 and the recruitment of, of the rest um, of the complex. So Swetansu set out initially to try to understand by quantitative IP mass spec, the composition of the complexes and whether this might mean something um, to cardiac differentiation. And so he took mouse embryonic stem cells that had a triple flag tag knock-in into BRG1. We got these from Len Panakio's lab. And he used uh, Gordon Keller's uh, different, differentiation method to drive these cells over the course of 10 days uh, to cardiac myocytes, sampling at day two, which is embryoid bodies, day four, which is mesoderm, day 5.3 or five or six, which is cardiac precursors. 
And this protocol involves the, the, the sprinkling on the cells of various cocktails of growth factors over this time course. And I'm showing you the details, not, not just for the aficionados, because I'm going to get back to, to some of these ingredients uh, at the very end. And so here's a Cipro Ruby stain of the complexes that, that he isolated. Um, they're beautiful complexes and they look like what you'd expect for bath complexes. And then with Nevin uh, Krogan's uh, uh, lab did uh, IP mass spec. And here's shown a heat map at these five stages of, of development. And what you can see is that you, the, the complex uh, composition changes from a largely uh, pluripotency oriented one to one that has different subunits in the cardiac precursors and the cardiac myocytes. And here's one that we expected, BAF6TC, so it's enriched just like in the mouse, in vivo. Here's one that we didn't know, BAF170, um, which, which, is, which is low as you, in the early stages of differentiation, but then cranks up. Um, and then the one in red here is, is involved in congenital heart disease. And the WDR5 here is a surprise. It shouldn't be there. Uh, it's usually part of, of, of uh, MLL complexes, but there it is. Okay, so BAF-170 was intriguing, and Swetansu did uh, knockout ES cells of BAF-60C and BAF-170 and found changes in gene expression and changes in complex composition. So the inclusion of certain complex, uh, subunits is, in fact, important for the overall um, uh, identity of the complex, and this was published um, in the middle of last year in development. And so he was interested also in, in BAF-170. So what does the BAF-170 complex look like? So we had BAF-170 triple flag knock-in lines also. Same thing, differentiate, flag IP mass spec. And we see basically a, a similar flavor of subunits, including WDR5 and SMARCD3, um, but also SMARCD2. And of course, we have BRG1, but we have also the other ATP is Brahma. So there must be at least two BAF-170 containing complexes, one that has one ATPase and one that has the other. Now, the, the interesting thing, or, or perhaps the, the less interesting thing about Brahma is that Brahma mouse knockouts don't have a developmental phenotype, or at least not a, an obviously discernible developmental phenotype. They're born in Mendelian ratios and they grow, in, but if you, you know, poke them hard enough, like ask their skeletal muscle to regenerate, um, they don't perform as well. Whereas BRG1 is super important for, for early development in, in, all or, in all organs. Yet we know that they're redundant with one another and in many cancers, you need both of them to be mutated um, to, to, have, to have an effect. And even Brahma by itself is found to be mutated in, in somatic uh, cancer. So what is Brahma doing? So because CRISPR was, was, uh, had been developed uh, by then, Swetansu said, okay, well, let's just, let's make Brahma knockouts and let's just, let's see what happens to cardiac differentiation. Can we tease something out? And indeed, we can certainly tease something out. Here on the left is a wild type line that's exuber exuberantly uh, beating. And then here on the right, you can see, I'm proving to you that this is a movie that's running. You can see some Brownian motion here. There's a lot of cells, um, but there's no, there's no beating at all. So what's going on in these dishes? What, what are the cells that are in here? And so the, the punch lines that by single cell RNA, RNA seq Here we have a UMAP of in blue, uh, the Brahma knockout lines at, at day 10 of differentiation, whereas in red, we have the knockouts, uh, the wild types, sorry, in red is the wild types. And you can see in the bottom in the feature plot that the wild types are expressing troponin T, they're mostly cardiac myocytes, but the knockouts in these various clusters are making neurons. They're not making, uh, they're not making uh, cardiac myocytes and they're not making the kind of thing that you'd expect from a failed cardiac differentiation. As Chuck would, would tell you, if we fail, if you have a, a poor cardiac differentiation, what you're normally going to get is you're going to get fibroblast and, and, and hematopoietic stem, hematopoietic cells. And that's not what we get here. So we get, you know, what we're calling immature neurons, beta three tubulin positive, neuro D, oleg two. We've got this population of here that expresses a very characteristic retinal uh, transcription factor, RACs, and other transcription factors, and other neurons right here. We do have a population here that looks osteoblast-like. It expresses periostin or biglycan. These could be fibroblast or osteoblast type things. And it's important what 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 is what the what is not being made here. So so like I said, we're in, these cells are not making other mesodermal derivatives. They're not making skeletal muscle. Um, they're not making any other types of, of of cells, and they're not making any endodermal derivatives. Nor are they making any other uh, ectodermal derivatives. So it's a very specific uh, altered path of differentiation. 
And if we stained with, with, stained with beta-3 tubulin in the wild and troponin T in the wild types, of course, we never see any beta-3 tubulin positive cells. Whereas in the, in the knockouts that don't express troponin T, now we have these clusters of beta-3 tubulin positive cells that are ex, 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 um, extending these processes that kind of look like, like neurites. So we think that we are at least look, looking at, uh, at least at the very least immature neurons. So when do Brahma knockout cells diverge from cardiogenesis and how do they diverge from cardiogenesis? And so we did a time course of single cell RNA-seq uh, starting at, at day four through, through day 10. And what I'm, what I'm showing you uh, here is, is the, the UMAP of a, a PAGA graph. And what you're, what you're seeing is that at day four, there's really not much difference between the knockouts and the wild types. They, they, they um, cohabitate in more or less the same UMAP space. They're a bit different from one another. And that reflects very modest changes uh, in gene expression, less than twofold expression of some genes um, like, like MESP1 or, or EOMES. So very small changes in, in gene expression. And yet, when, by the time you get to day six, Whereas the wild types here in the blue path go and populate these cells over here, uh, and then at day 10 go and, and populate these cells here. Now the, the Brahma knockouts have immediately diverged. Some of them go out here and make temporarily make a few hem hematopoietic cells, but then they don't make it past that. And you can see here in the isolated plots over here, the very different trajectories that the wild types take versus, versus the knockouts. And this happens very early on. And so you can see here EOMES that, that lights up very nicely, both the, the wild types and the knockouts, and troponin T that, uh, that uh, lights up only the knockouts. But here you can see right away at day six, you've got expression of GBX2 in the Brahma knockouts and CRAB BP2 at day six and then at, at later at, at day 10. So a very early uh, divergence. So we looked at this in a different way, again, using, using ERD. And we're, we're starting at, at day four. And in blue is the wild type path. And in orange is the knockout path. And you can see that, that in, in the at the mesoderm stage, they're co-populating um, this, 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 the beginning of, of the tree, the root, the root of the tree. And whereas in the, knockout, in the wild types, it follows this nice cascading differentiation towards various types of cardiac myocytes and, and, and other cells in the dish, the, the knockouts immediately transition to a, a different state and they and stay locked into that, that different state. And so we can look at some feature plots. You can see, for example, here, all of the cells express MESP1, the wild types go and express troponin T2, but the knockouts go and make either SOX2 right away or beta-3 tubulin immediately after the, the mesoderm stage and, and, and turn that on right there. So a very rapid and definitive uh, change in fate. So they're making mesoderm. So this is not like there's, there's a defect in the exit from pluripotency. Pluripotency is just fine. And we've actually gone now and done single cell RNA-seq at day zero and day two, and there's absolutely no change um, in the expression between the knockouts and the wild types. So they make it to mesoderm, they're, they're making pretty happy looking mesoderm, and then all of a sudden they, they, they switch over to making neuronal progenitors. So how does this work? I'm gonna tell you that we don't really understand how it works, but I'll tell you what we do know. So at day four, this mesoderm stage, when we do ataxic to look at chromatin accessibility, we do find changes in accessibility, but the, the changes in accessibility are in genes that are going to be turned on at the next, at the next step. So here, for example, is TBX5, where in the wild type, there's accessibility. TBX5 is not on at this stage yet, but it will be about a day later in differentiation. And you can see here in the Brahma knockout that these regulatory elements that, that are going to control uh, TBX5 are not open for business. Same. Same for SMAD5 over here. When we look at day six, it's a different picture. We again see more, uh, more sites that are inaccessible, such as the, the well-characterized enhancers of NKX25 over here, active and then now closed for business. But now we see the, the activation, the opening of, of enhancers for some of the neuronal regulators. And here I'm showing you ASCL1, a very potent neuronal uh, BHLH factor. And you can see that it's completely closed, inaccessible in the wild type, and it's nicely open uh, in the knockout. And, and, if, and, and we know that this is a neural enhancer because it sits right on top of, of, a, neuro, of a K27 acetyl mark from neural uh, precursor cells. So, so that tells us that, that, that there's, so that tells us how the cardiac program might be altered, but it doesn't, doesn't tell us how the neuronal program might already at day four be primed for, for activation. 
And so, and so we did H3K27 uh, chip seek reasoning that maybe there's a balance um, in, 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 um, in histone modifications that we might, that might not, not be reflected in chromatin accessibility. And we did find that there are some uh, clusters of some regions that, that, that do have increased uh, K27 um, acetylation. Of course, there's some with, with, with reduced uh, acetylation, um, but there's some with, with like the, the ones here that are involved with all the cardiac genes, but there are some here that are associated with regulation of neurogenesis. And so we did motif finding, and I'm only going to focus on the increased uh, peaks. And what we found, as you can see here, the top motifs that we found are all OCT family motifs. So OCT4, BRAIN1, which is a PU, PU factor, OTX2, also PU factor, and OCT6. Oops. Well, I can't go back. And so we, we looked at the, MR, at the mRNA data, and we could see that if we didn't pay attention to statistics, so in other words, forgot the FDR value, OCT6 mRNA was slightly uh, increased um, in the knockouts at day four. And here I'm showing you Western blot, where you can see here at day zero, there's low level of OCT6. It increases quite a bit at, at day two, but normally in a wild type, it would, it would be greatly reduced at day four and then undetectable at day six and onwards. And what we find is that there's a perdurance or persistence of OCT6 protein at day six that remains uh, Oh, sorry, day four, sorry, the meso at that mesoderm stage that uh, remains about in day six. And this is concomitant with a reduction in, in the nascent expression of BAF6TC. So there's a reduction in BAF6TC protein, despite there not being much of a, of a change um, in, in uh, BAF6TC mRNA. So we thought, okay, well, is, if this upregulation of, of OCT6 or PU3F1, is it important? And so, so what we did is we, is we uh, looked in the knockouts at uh, troponin T and beta P tubulin, and then and then did the knockouts with an siRNA against pu 3 f one And while this doesn't rescue the cardiogenesis, there's no now expression of, of TNT2. We find that reduction, uh, you know, reduction of levels of pu 3 f one impairs the neurogenesis. So we think that at the very least, pu 3 f one is important for the neurogenic aspect of the uh, differentiation um, of the Brahma knockouts into neuronal precursors. Okay, and if we look at, so we also did uh, Brahma chip seek, and there's very few sites at day four, um, but there's more and more sites when you get to, to, to day 10. And at day 10, as we expect, we find a number of cardiac transcription factors. And so that makes sense with turning on the cardiac program, some of them also at day six. What we found consistent at all stages is, is a highly significant enrichment for, for rest. And rest counters uh, neurogenesis. And what we find is, is by Western blot is that at least at day 10, there's, there's Im impaired expression um, of rest in the Brahma knockouts. And again, if we do an siRNA to rest, we find that uh, in the wild type cells, we get spontaneous uh, activation of, of beta-3 beta tubulin. Um, and we're now looking to see what happens to, uh, to troponin T. So we're starting to get a handle on, on sort of some of the, the molecular players that are downstream of, of, what, of what Brahma is, is regulating. Um, but, but we're still puzzled by a number of things. One is what really is the initiating event? So we're try, really trying to figure that out. But then why, why, does, why does the mouse knockout not have a phenotype? And we started thinking about what's happening at this mesoderm induction stage. And one of the more most important and most sensitive aspects of the differentiation protocol is the amount of BMP4 that's added to the culture. And so those of, those of you who have, who have tried um, this protocol will, will bang your head against the wall because the dosage of BMP4 has to be very, very finely titrated from batch to batch or from line to line to be able to get a good cardiac differentiation, a uh, good efficiency of, of cardiac myocyte in the end. So, so, so Swatansu thought, you know, may, maybe we're maybe we're dealing with it with a, a BMP issue. And what so what he did is play around with the BMP concentrations. And, and what he found was that within the normally permissible range uh, of, of BMP concentration, where the wild types differentiate well, the Brahma knockouts still differentiated improperly. And this is the range that we normally go back and you know back and forth in a little bit under 1.6, a little bit over 1.6 to get a, a good differentiation. And so nothing happens. But if Swatansu went and, and, and increased the dose of BMP4 by four times, 
there where in the wild type, now they really don't like it. And I'll, I'll show you in a minute, they make fibroblasts and hematopoietic cells instead. Now there's a complete rescue of the cardiac differentiation defect. So, so this, this, this propensity for Brahma knockout mesoderm to spontaneously turn into neuronal precursors is completely uh, compensated for by increasing the dosage of BMP4. So what's happening? So we did single cell RNA-seq across the time course, across the dosages to figure this out. And I know these UMAPs are really complicated, but here's, here's the, the annotation over here. And on the, on the left is the different genotypes. And I'm gonna walk you through the, the different uh, genotypes. So first, again, we, we reproduced our original observation that at the, at the day four, the mesoderm stage, the, the pink wild type cells clustered very near the, the knockout cells. And that while the, 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 the pink wild type cells take this trajectory to make cardiac myocytes via a cardiac precursor intermediate, the knockouts don't, they take a completely different path and end up making these neuronal progenitors. But now, when you crank the dose of BMP4, so, in, so I'm, I'm keeping the, the pink wild types at low BMP4 in it here, and I'm showing you the, the orange uh, high, high BMP knockouts. What you're seeing is that, first of all, the high BMP puts both the, the wild type and the knockouts in a different UMAP space. So they're slightly different from one another. But then the knockouts then go and reform this, this little Valentine's heart shape here in the middle of the UMAP, they make normal cardiac precursors, and then they go and make normal cardiac myocytes. So in a, so, so in a sense, we've restored the exit of, from mesoderm such that now the high BMP is allowing a proper cardiac precursor differentiation and a, and a proper cardiac myocyte differentiation. So what I've shown you and, and, and what I don't have time to, to show you, but we have now mathematical modeling that supports it, is that in the wild type situation, normally you, you you go down the mesoderm groove in the Waddington landscape and you're stuck in the mesoderm groove. You can make maybe cardiac myocytes, but if you, if you don't, if you go down the other side, you're gonna make maybe blood or fibroblasts or endothelial cells, but that's all you're gonna get a chance to make. In the Brahma knockouts, we've released uh, the, this groove and, and while the, the cells will still enter the mesoderm path, when they get to this point in taking a decision, now what, now what they face is what's called the saddle node bifurcation, where there's no longer a nice trough that keeps them there, but the genome is overly plastic. And now they're going to roll off to wherever it is that has permissible chromatin. And, and what I also didn't, didn't tell you is that many of the neuronal genes are, are pre-open um, prior to uh, you know, at, at the mesoderm stage, they're not actively closed. So we think that this is basically a, a, a cell, an auto um, trans differentiation uh, that takes place uh, based on a very specific conformation of the genome. So I'm going to stop there and, and thank everybody in the lab, current lab uh, noted here, former members noted here. We have great collaborators at Gladstone and UCSF phenomenal cores uh, at Gladstone that, that make, uh, make all the experiments we do possible. And then the specific collaborators that, that we had on the many aspects um, of this project. And I will stop there and answer any questions. Um, Benoit, this is Chuck. I'll, I'll start then. Uh, what, what, what a fun lecture that was. That was, that was really, uh, that, that was quite cool. I, I'm, my mind is stuck on the Swy Sniff stuff, so maybe I can yeah. ask you a, a question about that. I'm trying to decide whether, the, the, is this a pathway that, that this complex that with via Brahma normally represses that is now activated, or is it vice versa? How, how do you sort of look at the causality here? It's hard to say. Um, I think that it probably there probably is an aspect of, of active of active repression, and we certainly have that notion from you know the the the, the de novo uh, deposition of K twenty seven acetylation marks at that mesoderm stage uh, in the absence of Brahma. The other possibility that we're exploring is that in the absence of Brahma, the remaining so BRG one the remaining ATPA is BRG one now assembles into a pro-neurogenic BAF complex. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so Jerry Crabtree's lab has categorized certain uh, BAF complexes as, as being, um, you know, there's, there's their ESL BAF, their pluripotency BAF, 
And then there's an NP and an NBAF that are neural precursor and neural BAF. And those complexes have a very specific uh, composition. And while they haven't shown that they're necessarily um, potent enough to induce neurogenesis, they're, they're impotent enough to drive the transition from a neural precursor uh, to a neuron, for example. Um, mm -hmm. Although I think they do have results with their MIR-9 work on reprogramming showing that that, that switch is actually um, more instructive than, than what one might think. So we, so we as of yesterday, have uh, BRG1 complexes isolated that we're sending from mass spec um, in all of the conditions at all of the time points um, to, to then do the quantitative mass spec and see if there's a, a, uh, a smoking gun in the composition of the complex. Yeah, how interesting, thank you. Maybe I was I wondering um, if you have tried to, this is Christine, this touch, if you tried to re-add uh, BRM at different stages to see if you can switch it back to the other, we haven't done an add, yeah. We haven't done an add back, but we've done we we've done it doesn't 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 answer your question. But but we've 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 uh, done a Degron experiment where where we're able to with an oxygen inducible Degron uh, deplete uh, Brahma protein at various time points, and if we deplete Brahma after day four after the mesoderm induction stage, it makes uh, cardiac cells just fine. So it really is important in that in that mesoderm induction window between day two and, and, and day four. Alessandro, you had a question? Yeah, hello, I'm, I'm in a very nice talk. Uh, so just to go back to the first part of your talk, I have a two-part question on the same point, which was the very interesting uh, transcriptional network regulated by TBX5. Uh, so I found something that I, I wasn't expecting there, which was RBM20. And I was wondering if you have any comment about that, because it's a very interesting gene of mine. And for the background, for everyone else, it's a splicing regulator involved in DCM. And then I, I didn't find something I was perhaps expecting, which was GATA4, uh, which is you know well shown by, by you and others to be a very close interaction with TBX5. I was just wondering if you could elaborate on, on those two uh, aspects. Yeah, so so RBM20, I mean, uh, you know, as as you know very well, involved in, in cardiomyopathy, and and as I as I showed, there's there's some degree of sarcomere disarray uh, in, in, in the mutants. Now, patients with patients with TBX5 mutations. Have not been primarily characterized as, as necessarily as having uh, dilated cardiomyopathy, um, but they do have they do have defects in 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 overall in in, in cardiac uh, anatomy. I don't think anybody's done a histology on a on a on a TBX5 mutation patient, um, but certainly our mice have 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 altered overall you know dilation uh, uh, of the heart. The thing is that there's there's a, there's a you know, it, it, it's hard to ascribe one one gene to one uh, phenomenon. Um, but you know, what, what we would want to do is is to is to look at, at things that RBM twenty regulates and determine whether that d this disruption in gene expression um, uh, means anything. And what was the question about GATA four? Uh, nothing. I was perhaps expecting to see that within that network, and I was wondering if it, ah. you just didn't highlight it, or for some reason it didn't pop up in this analysis. I think we only looked at things that changed in, in centrality. And so GATA4 maintains, it's in the network, but it maintains its, its centrality. Its centrality is not disrupted. Okay. Just to follow up on the RBN20, yeah. I would be very curious to know if titing uh, splicing alter, is altered in your, in your condition. Right, 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 right. Because titing expression is reduced, but is, is it splicing altered also? That's right. That's a very, very good question. Um, somebody should look at that. Uh, <laughs> I don't, we, yeah, exactly. I think uh, Lisa had, a, had her, has her hand up. Hi, yeah, thanks, thanks for your talk. Um, I wanted to ask about the TBX5 work um, where it looks like you're not just getting cell differentiation defects, but like more like cell identity changes. Um, and so I was wondering in, uh, for VSD defects, things like that, do you think that those are more, um, not just differentiation, defects, but like cell sorting um, yeah. changes? Yes, where, you know, Cells are, are trying to sort out identities um, yeah. as opposed to just not being able to differentiate fully. Yeah, absolutely. That's exactly what, what we think. I mean, I mean it's, it's, it's sort of a combination, right? So, so it's partly, I think that there's, there's, there's broad, not broad, I mean, there's specific defects in, 
in gene regulation, but cellularly, how does that translate to a ventricular septation defect? And so in the, 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 the lineage labeled mouse hearts that I showed you, where instead of being sort of, you know, lined up against one another, that there's now this mixing, we think that, that some of the gene expression changes are going to be related to that. And so we have some in intriguing uh, clues from some of the single cell RNA-seq where we think that um, slit netrin signaling might be affected um, as well as gap junctions that, that might be important. So we're going to start now. Now we have to go back to, to, to the embryo and, and, and say, okay, where are those genes expressed and, and do they correlate with, with the location? Because now we know where to look for, right? We know where to look for that at the red cells or the boundary between the green and non-green cells. And we know, you know, so, so we're going to be doing that in the next few months. Abby has her hand up. Hello. Uh, I'm kind of crashing the pathology seminar here because it's not my department. Uh, but I was wondering, um, that's what's great to see you. Um, but so for, I'm not sure how it is about mouse stem cell lines, but I know for at least IPS stem cell lines, um, like different lines have different propensities for various lineages, like the WTC11 has a greater pr propensity for ectoderm or whatever. Um, and so I was wondering if, if that plays a role in the Brahma knockout going towards the neuron lineage, and if perhaps like different, if you got the mouse stem cells from different sources, if they'd fall into a different lineage. Yeah, well, so, so, so that's, I mean, that's a good point. Could we use different, different lines? Um, I, I, I would say that that's perhaps un unlikely because what we're, what we're doing here is that we're not letting them spontaneously differentiate towards something. Right? We're using a directed differentiation. And that's in fact why, why perhaps we're, we're seeing something that we don't see in the mouse, which is, which is then we, we, we think we've understood by cranking up the BMP4 dosage is that with keeping the, 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 the cytokines in a, in a narrow window of concentrations, we're not allowing any compensation um, out from there. Whereas in vivo, we know that there's robust compensation to many disturbances in, in several aspects um, of development. So I suspect that, that, that it's more the, the product of the, of the technique that we, we're using to differentiate rather than a, a cell line um, specific pro propensity. Um, it, it might, it might be interesting to, to do that. Um, but you know, as you know, it's, it's a lot of work and expense to, to ask that question. Thank you. And thanks Chuck. <laughs> He's saying they let engineers in too. Yeah. <laughs> Chuck. I have another question. I can't, I can't resist. The, uh, I was just struck by ASCL1 uh, coming up in the, Brahma, in the Brahma knockouts. And have you explored whether that is playing a causal role in the, the neural trans differentiation? No, we have not. We, we've really tried to focus on, on the things that are taking place before that gene uh, turns mm -hmm. on. I'm sure, it's, I'm sure it's an important you know, downstream mediator um, but there are many uh, neuronal transcription factors that, 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 that turn on and are likely going to be, you know, cascading towards, towards the neuronal phenotype. But we, 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 what we'd really like to understand is, is the initiating factor yeah. before that chromatin gets, um, get, gets altered. Uh, yeah. and that's why we focus uh, on it could that. happen, but it's not the most interesting part of the cascade, I guess. That's correct. That's right. Yeah. That's right. I, it, I, I would probably agree with that, actually. Yeah, yeah. It would be unsurprising if it wasn't a component of, of the, the self reprogramming, mm -hmm. which is what, what we consider this to be. Okay. And in terms of the, the redundant, in terms of, of potential, why the, the mouse knockout doesn't have a phenotype also is, is um, we think is likely to be a redundancy with, with BRG1. We know that, that in, in, in Brahma knockout tissues, there's an increase in BRG1 protein. Um, and, and so we're making right now, we're harvesting next week, our first batch of of Brahma BRG1 uh, double knockouts um, to be able to see what that looks like. But, so maybe I would have a different, a different conclusion uh, for you at the end of the seminar if it were next week. Well, if there are no more questions, 
Uh, we just like to thank you again for one, a wonderful, wonderful seminar, but two, a really fantastic discussion. So I want to thank not only you for giving such a great talk, but everyone else for participating, even though we're all in this little virtual bubble. So thank you so, so much. That was such a killer talk. Really great work. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks. Come back again after the pandemic, Benoit. We'll take you out for dinner. Excellent. I will. Okay. Thank you. Good to see you. Good to see you too. See you. Hope you're doing well.